if you give users the ability to play with the parameters, see what other people see, right? That could potentially be a game changer with respect to how we understand each other. Yeah, I love that. And I love that. And you combine that with the, with the marketplace idea because uh, that way there would be innovation in these sliders, right? Okay, what kind of sl- not just right left, that's kind of stupid. How about open minded versus closed minded? How about neurotic versus anti neurotic, right? Uh, you know, you could, sl- you could have all kinds of interesting ideas. Uh, or, you know, or again, someone could actually put, I want to look, I want to look at the world the way Kim Kardashian looks at it for. 30 right. seconds before I went insane. Right. Uh, and and uh, there'll be lots of innovation in the features around feeds. So but I love your idea. I, frankly, I've never thought about that. That's a that's a great one. I'm stealing that. And I'll give, <laughs> and I'll awesome. give credit when I remember that Brett Weinstein said that we should uh, have sliders on our feed owl goals and uh, be able to switch uh, shoes with other people and see the world from their, that alone, see the world from their perspective for even if it's just an hour would be really quite valuable. Hey folks, welcome to the Dark Horse Podcast. I am, of course, am Dr. Brett Weinstein, and I have the distinct pleasure of sitting today with my good friend, Jim Rutt. Jim is a podcaster. He is the host of the Jim Rutt Show. He is a he is the former chairman of the Santa Fe Institute, which studies complexity. He is a tech entrepreneur and investor, and he is a co-founder of the Game B Movement. Jim, welcome to the Dark Horse Podcast. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, reconnect with uh, with Brett. We've had some uh, good times over the years. We certainly have. Now, am I right? I was looking back over our history, and I think I've been on your show a couple times, but this is your first time on Dark Horse. Is that right? That is correct. Wow. All right. Well, that is a mistake that we are correcting as of this moment. I should probably uh, alert my my viewers to who you are and what our connection is. Some of it will be evident to people from that introduction. But you and I met when you and Jordan Hall, who was then known as Jordan Green Hall, invited me to what was not yet the Game B movement. At the time, it was called the Emancipation Party. Um, We can possibly get into some of that history later if it becomes relevant. But nonetheless, uh, I met you as a, I would say, long since recovered um, Reaganite right winger. I think you have told me that your uh, your Reaganite position began to break down in the early 90s. Is that correct? Yeah, I was a basically, I would say I was a Goldwater Republican. And in fact, I one time wrote in Goldwater, I think it was 1984 presidential GOP primary in Cambridge, Massachusetts, which was quite humorous uh, because uh, Reagan had pissed me off about something or other. So I considered myself a Goldwater Republican up till 1991. Uh, with the demise of the USSR, rabid anti-communism, was, which had been my main attraction to the Republicans, uh, went away as uh, a main issue. And I kind of started getting repulsed by the other parts of the coalition. And 92, I actually voted for Bill Clinton and have uh, never voted for a Republican presidential candidate since. Very interesting. So uh, I will say, you know, it's funny. I look back at all of the, uh, the hyperventilating anti-communism of the era you describe and um yes it looked crazy on the other hand now that i see all sorts of communism arising in all sorts of minds without most of them even realizing that that's what they are invoking it looks different to me now uh, in some sense that the uh, the paranoia was partially paranoia and partially uh, far-sighted and maybe not as articulate as it might have been about what the hazards were maybe it didn't even really know yeah, I would say that's uh, fair, though. I, I will say I do have not and will not ever repent for my fairly aggressive anti-Marxist Leninism back in the day. No, I think uh, history has actually borne out the hazard. And I must say, I've done a good bit of thinking um, in the time since you and I met about what the hazards of communism are, why they exist, whether they're solvable. Um, and I've concluded that, in fact, it is a a malignant perspective inherently that even if it starts with good intentions it inevitably evolves in a direction that's that's devastating and we are now watching this unfold in various places we're seeing one version of it uh, in china we're seeing another version of it domestically but 
it leads nowhere good. And one of the jobs I think people like you and me have is to articulate the reason that it cannot work and that even if it has sympathy from you on the basis that it, it has an objective that sounds good, that that objective is something that can only be achieved with a different mechanism, one that is game theoretically well constructed. Uh, so anyway, maybe, maybe we'll get back to that later. But when you and I met, I know that you regarded me as a uh, a far uh, a far left person, and probably regarded me with some suspicion as a result of that. I think you and I came to an understanding very quickly that those labels aren't particularly uh, evocative of the actual. Uh, programs and suppositions running in each of our minds. And anyway, we've become good friends. And I know that you're certainly somebody that I find always has a fresh perspective on things that I'm uh, grappling with. And uh, I would have a very hard time placing you politically on the map. You, you, uh, you're independent minded on every front. And that has been uh, I believe, an excellent match for an era in which there just simply is no cheat sheet that tells you, you know, one side doesn't have it right. Basically, everyone's got it wrong. And so if you don't have an a la carte view of what policies you might want to see enacted, then basically you're you're in the weeds. Yeah, and I think uh, that describes me pretty well. I mean, in like, say, in economic matters, I'm probably to the left of Bernie, right? Uh, on the other hand, I'm a Second Amendment, uh, pretty strong guy, but not an absolutist. Uh, you know, when it comes to uh, things, I you know, climate change, I take that right seriously. Don't believe it's uh, bogus by any means, right? And uh, and so, you know, I, I choose what I believe to be true. And, and I guess what makes... Uh, me makes other people uncomfortable sometimes when they're talking to me about politics is that I, I just seem to lack the gene uh, for the tribal knee jerk, right? I don't feel at all compelled to associate myself with one of the political tribes. And I think that was one of the things that we were trying to do with the emancipation party uh, was to go off in an orthogonal direction, something that uh, actually spent no time thinking about left or right. Though when I go back and read the emancipation party reforms, you know, in in uh, 19, uh, 2012, when we did it, you would have called it left uh, to a quite degree. And oh, by the way, those old reforms are still up on the Internet. I still pay the 10 bucks a month or whatever. Keep it up. Emancipationparty.org. I don't think you can find it with Google, but it, you can type in emancipationparty.org and read our uh, 10 uh, reforms and all that stuff. Uh, but what they didn't do is get into the identity politics stuff. And that's where. Uh, in some sense, modern, uh, the modern the two dimensional red blue was stupid anyway. But now when uh, the blue team has essentially abandoned uh, economic uh, opportunity and egalitarianism as the basis for their uh, for their whole political perspective and instead has turned it into identitarianism, essentially uh, neo tribal racism, the way I would describe it, uh, you know, uh, makes me not interested in. Uh, those far, far reaches, at least, this, you know, the second half of Team Blue. Uh, yet I'm still, as I say, left to Bernie on economic matters, probably. And uh, and that's OK by me. Yep. Yeah. I must say, as, as you know, and as some of uh, some of my viewers will know, my sense is that one of the mistakes that we made in uh, in our collaboration over the Emancipation Party and Game B is that the Emancipation Party evolved into Game B rather than the Emancipation Party becoming a project of Game B. And my sense is that history very quickly bore out the idea that there was room for a third party effort and one that was well constructed and non-ideological and uh, non-identitarian would have been very popular. We now see Andrew Yang, of course, trying to boot up something like that. Obviously, there's the uh, Unity 2020 effort, which, uh, you know, was never widely uh, understood, but was certainly caught the attention of, of some influential people. And Anyway, there's clearly a hunger for some alternative to the duopoly, and there is also an awareness that basically we're stuck in a trap in which every time somebody comes up with this obvious idea, they become, you know, uh, basically 
they are portrayed as unwitting dupes of the greater evil. And effectively, we have to escape that puzzle, which is why Unity 2020 was structured the way it was to make that to, to neutralize that concern. But uh, in any case, I think the Emancipation Party was a great idea a few years ahead of its time. A few years yeah, ahead I agree of its time. If we kept with it, uh, you know, we, it might well have gotten some traction. But the time wasn't right. It was just too hard. And I think the fact that many of the leading figures were business dudes uh, led us to a premature abandonment. You know, us business guys, well, oh, shit, you know, we're not getting any traction. And we tried six different things. We didn't get traction on any of them. So I guess, uh, I guess this is not the product to sell at this point in time. And that prob was probably accurate. But if we had uh, waited three or four years, the times might well have been better uh, for this orthogonal. Uh, with my, uh, my uh, wife, uh, who was a member of the Emancipation Party in the early Game B movement, calls pragmatic progressivism mm -hmm. uh, as uh, and I think that's really what the EP was all about. And and there's such a gigantic hole in the center like there's never been before. And, and just a final reminder, I, I did buy the domain name Brett Weinstein 2024. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so whenever you're ready, let me know. I think there are a lot of people hoping that I don't even survive till 2024. So anyway. Public Goods was one of our very first sponsors, and we are as pleased with them now as we were when we first tried their products. Public Goods can simplify your life as a one-stop shop for everyday essentials. Their ingredients are carefully sourced, high quality, and their products are affordable. Public Goods has coffee and tea. They have grains and oils like olive and avocado. They have Castile soap, trash bags and essential oils. They have spices and extracts like vanilla and almond, vinegar and pasta, dishware and glassware. There is so much at Public Goods to make a meal, including the materials to serve it on. Public Goods products have a great design, too. The aesthetic is simple and clean. There are no garish colors. Public Goods cares about health and sustainability. Their products are free of harmful ingredients and additives, and their ingredients are ethically sourced. Finally, their subscription service is efficient and simple and easy to use. Public Goods members can buy all of their premium essentials in one place. It really is an everything store, a little like that other internet everything store, but without even a hint of evil. For Dark Horse listeners, we have the following offer. Receive $15 off your first public goods order with no minimum purchase. They are so confident that you will absolutely love their products and come back again and again that they are giving you $15 to spend on your first purchase. Go to publicgoods.com slash darkhorse or use the code darkhorse at checkout. That is publicgoods.com, P-U-B-L-I-C-G-O-O-D-S dot com slash dark horse to receive $15 off your first order. The interesting thing about what you're describing is that if the Emancipation Party was ahead of its time, it was so barely ahead of its time that something is wrong with any system that would, uh, would declare it so on the basis that it missed by three or four years. Right. And so one of the things I think we've learned from what happened with the Game B movement, when the Game B movement came apart, when it stopped being a group of people who was uh, meeting in a physical space that you had rented for us, uh, you described what it was that you were doing in terminating that effort as putting it into spore mode. In my language, I would say that Game B was a prototype and I was focused from the beginning on seeing how far we could go and at the point that it failed, learning what the lessons of that failure were so that Game C or Game D could do the job because something certainly has to. And in any case, no matter what language you use, whether it's spore mode or prototyping or navigation or any of these metaphors, what we do see is that the concept of Game B um, has actually caught on and it's acquired some uh, of its most powerful thinkers in the aftermath of the stage in which there were actual physical meetings anywhere, right? So people uh, who pay attention to Dark Horse will probably know Daniel Schmachtenberger, for example. He uh, is an important feature of the Game B movement, though he came to it, I don't even think we knew who he was at the point that we were meeting in physical space. So in any case, Somehow we've got to get out of the business mindset where the idea is, oh, the Emancipation Party isn't getting any traction. It must be the wrong idea and kill it off and get into a different mindset where as soon as we know that something has to occur, the question is, well, 
how do we continue? How do we put this thing into a low cost, like a seed or a spore into a mode where it doesn't cost anything to just idle so that at the moment that the temperature is right, it can be unveiled and we're not starting from scratch. That's um, work, that worked with Game B, right? The spores uh, rehatched in 2018 uh, due to uh, fortuitous things, basically a, a essay that uh, Jordan Hall wrote. And then it's, you know, it's now going. It's pretty, pretty big. There's at least 30,000 people that would identify themselves as Game B. Uh, we recently put out a film. Uh, people can check it out at gamebfilm.org. Uh, we have a online community of uh, a few thousand people at game-b.org. Better put a www. Uh, behind that, for some reason, the hosting company can't figure it out without the WWW. And uh, there's some uh, real activities uh, starting proto bees, the, the building of on the ground communities. Two already exist, though neither of them are what I'd call in pure form. And I know of at least 20 other groups that are working uh, to figure out how to pull the capital together and the team together, et cetera. And two of them are pretty far along. Yeah, and, I, I would and, say it's done exactly the right thing. It's not only uh, managed to persist through that period, but it has diversified. So we've got proto bees, we've, you know, various people who were part of the game bee movement or who quickly uh found us or we found them have their own versions people in other words have taken the idea and they've forked it and you know for heather and me uh, the last chapter of our book uh talks about the fourth frontier which is explicitly our take on what a game b future would have to look like for those who don't know what we're talking about game b wise game b is a very simple idea it's not a plan, but it, it is an idea that our system is on a fatal trajectory and that it requires, if we are to persist, it requires that we find a better solution. And the key insight, the thing that makes it better than every other version of this idea, is that game B, whatever it is, has to be game theoretically stable. It has to be uh, an evolutionarily stable strategy. It has to beat game A in its own terms. In other words, we can't say, here is a blueprint of a better society. Now let's start a revolution, win the power to make it, etc. It has to be so good that it is effectively contagious and displaces game A in a world that has been structured by game A. Um, and it is a, you know, a non-utopian uh, analytical approach to solving that problem. So anyway, I think those of us who understand why that has to be the general form of the solution effectively can't and won't walk away with it. We may never accomplish it, but we know that someone must. And uh, until it is accomplished, effectively, the short time horizon of modern civilization is presently structured and the potential extension, indefinite extension that could be achieved if we got to this game B space uh, it's obviously the right thing to do, whatever the form that it takes might be. Yeah, and I would just add one other thing. You hit all the main biggest points. Uh, the other is in this non-utopianism. This is critical, is that it, we have an empirical and experimental perspective. Uh, many of the people involved in formulating the original Game B idea either had a background in complexity or uh, were infected by it, or it's near neighbors like evolutionary theory. Uh, and if you know anything about these domains, you know the ability to predict the unfolding of a complex system over any extended period of time is bupkis, right? Uh, you can't do it. Uh, you, and in fact, the whole definition of an emergence in complexity is something which cannot be predicted uh, with any plausible amount of computation, at least from the current state of the pieces. And so uh, very important in game B thinking is that we have a theory, we sort of have a destination, but we, we hold it very lightly. And we try things, we probe systems, we build little things, uh, we experiment, we analyze, and then we share the results horizontally, whether they worked or not. And that makes us totally different than 
uh, guys that show up with this tome that says, here's the truth. If we just did this, uh, we'll solve all mankind's problems. We know where that generally leads, which is to the gas chamber. Yeah, to gulag starvation, gas chambers, that kind of thing. Yeah, Um, Yeah, I would say I would counsel us to stop talking about vaguely knowing the destination. And I think if we talk in terms of knowing the trajectory, we know what direction we should be heading. But we also know that we will be surprised by the final structure if we allow ourselves to be taught by the complex system about what the real rules actually are. And as, as far as the utopianism goes, as, as you probably know, um, I've said many times, I think, that utopia is the worst concept that anyone ever came up with, right? It's this very seductive, n- impossible place, and uh, that it has, you know, as you point out, led to all kinds of tragedies of history. But when people hear you say that, they sometimes get the sense of like, oh, I'm no longer so interested because it sounds like some brutal, pragmatic future that isn't very exciting. And my point would be, look, in a complex system, we know that there are no perfect solutions. There is nothing like utopia. But take a good look at a hummingbird sometime. It's non-utopian. It's built with uh, feedbacks, right? That's how it works. But a Step at a time. Somehow it got to the hummingbird. Isn't it, that amazing? It right? got to the hummingbird. And if you look at it and you say, yeah, that's the level of imperfection we might be shooting for, it's pretty darn good, right? It's pretty close to what any rational person would call a miracle if you didn't know that there was a process that had built it up incrementally. And so anyway, non-utopian doesn't mean it couldn't be marvelous, it means it won't be marvelous right away. It will take a long time to get where we're going, and it will be surprising in its structure because there's no one on earth who can blueprint it from here. Amen, brother. <laughs> and by the way, the hummingbirds have just returned to our farm. We yeah, have they've humming- just come back here too. I That's never it. tire of watching them. Uh, never, you know, never, never. We sit on our porch, humming, hummingbird feeders on both ends, and watch them go at it. It's fun. It's beautiful. I, I uh, as of this morning, may be on the trail of a nest. I've never had a nest that I could watch them raise chicks in. So anyway, I'll, I'll keep you all posted on whether or not I figure out where it is. But let's get to the, um, the heart of the matter that has us uh, podcasting together today. You, as of I think this morning, have a new article out on Quillette, excuse me, Quillette. Is that right? Correct, correct. All right. So I will say I have at the moment a kind of a fraught relationship uh, with Quillette, Um, Claire Lehman having ruthlessly uh, attacked Heather and me over the course of at least the last year plus. But anyway, let's put that aside. I uh, initially was a huge fan of Quillette and in principle I still am, although I uh, can't help but be somewhat annoyed at, at her uh, her approach to someone I think she would have called a friend. But nonetheless, you have an article out. Your article is about Elon Musk's acquisition of Twitter and what it may mean to us. And in fact, I think it's fair to say that your article contains some guidance that comes from a very long history, not only of thinking about structures and complexity and ways that systems like Twitter can be improved, but also very directly a long history of participation in online forums of every kind, right? You you have as long a history as anybody I know stretching back to long before uh, any of the structures on the modern internet. I mean, back into the bulletin board days. Am I right about that? Or that even, back to 1981, right? To the very beginning. Uh, I designed, I wrote, I uh, uh, early forum software. Uh, I managed uh, many to many communications businesses as a product manager as early as 1982. Uh, you know, to this day, I'm a, a part owner of the Well, which is the uh, oldest surviving, I think, online uh, virtual community, uh, which still to this day has amazingly high quality uh, discourse, even though it's quite small community. We sometimes joke it's the colonial Williamsburg of the internet. Uh, And so, yeah, I've been doing this for a long time. And of course I run the, uh, help run the Game B uh, platforms and, you know, been involved in various things. And so, yeah, that was the idea was to bring what I have learned from watching uh, it with real bullets, uh, you know, how hard it is to make virtual community work uh, and, uh, you know, take and, you know, take some of what Elon had to say and kind of mix it all together and talk about his critics and then lay out uh, how I think 
uh, he may be on the right path and that his uh, some of his critics, at least, are guilty of uh, uh, gross straw manning uh, and not talking honestly about uh, what's going on. And uh, yeah, so that's basically was the intent. And I do hope he reads it. And I've actually been trying to explore my connections to people, see if I can get somebody to get it into his hands. And maybe I will, maybe I won't. I'll let you know if I do. Well, I think there's a, a decent chance um, that this conversation will cause him to take a look at it. Uh, I will certainly there will be a link to your article in the description of this podcast. And uh, I tweeted my own thoughts about things that I felt were necessary to a, a functional Twitter environment before reading your article this morning. Um, and I tagged him. So I don't know that he, he will see any of those things. Obviously, the amount of traffic aimed at him is absolutely staggering. And so it's possible uh, f for anything to get lost. But nonetheless, there's so much in what you wrote that is, I mean, for one thing, your central point, or at least your initial point, is so obviously um, clarifying with respect to how, you know, there's a fundamental paradox that anybody who's thought about the question of free speech has to grapple with, which is you effectively either forego all moderation and you create an instant dystopia because of all the terrible things that can happen, or you sign up for some level of moderation. And then the point is you become responsible for where you draw that line. And there's no good way to make everyone uh, happy. But your point, if I understand you correctly, is that there's actually a very natural place to draw a line that will not make everyone happy, but it is maximally likely to be useful as a, you know, a first stroke on the canvas. And that, uh, you want to lay it out? Sure. And I, because uh, exactly, because uh, there's so much of the reaction to the idea of Musk taking over Twitter uh, was extremely simplistic. And I, I actually quote in the article, two experts, world-class experts saying, oh, Elon's going to have no moderation at all. It's going to be the law of the jungle, et cetera, right? And he had previously laid out on the TED Talk, which I have a link to in the essay, uh, that he, you know, that he obviously knows there has to be some moderation. So I thought about it a little bit and said, all right, how can we explain this? What is lacking in this conversation? And I realized it was, frankly, a, some, a simple ontology and vocabulary problem. Because uh, people are thinking simplistically, moderation, yes, moderation, no, free speech, absolutist, you know, uh, totalitarian fascist dictatorship. Nope, wrong. And so the ontology I laid out, the vocabulary I laid out is to distinguish first content moderation from what I call decorum moderation. Uh, decorum could also be called behavior. Uh, basically, decorum, which I talk about first, is uh, analogous to manners in the real world. Uh, I, I use the example, for instance, uh, yeah, we might share the, uh, the gory details of our most recent dating debacle with our close friends over a few drinks, uh, but we're probably not likely to do that at our grandmother's uh, Sunday dinner table. And the distinction between manners with our friends over drinks and manners at our grandmother's uh, uh, dinner table correspond to uh, decorum rules in different kinds of online venues. For instance, uh, you know, a family oriented online system like Disney might have one set of decorum rules, a more serious one like uh, uh, Twitter for adults might have a different set. And, uh, you know, 8chan might have an entirely different one. And it's absolutely key uh, to the success of a, of a platform that you think about what your uh, who your audience is, what your purpose is, and you craft a decorum uh, set of decorum rules and decorum moderation that's appropriate for what what you want. Uh, you know, in a case like Twitter uh, and many main, more or less mainstream ones, some of the obvious forms of decorum are, uh, you know, no racial slurs directed at people. I prefer the rule of no personal attacks directed at another person uh, that's a member of the community. Uh, you know, you, uh, there's some funny ones like uh, uh, Facebook has a rule, no nipples. The only time I ever got a sanction until I got banned by Facebook was I posted a story about uh, 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 kind of hippie communes. And on the picture that was pulled forward, there was a 
uh, like a four-year-old child uh, with long hair couldn't tell the uh, the gender uh, or the sex, to be more precise. Uh, and nipples were showing. So uh, Facebook uh, kicked it. So that's the quorum. You can be absurd and ludicrous like uh, Facebook is, or you can be, uh, you know, smart and, you know, be uh, and enumerate uh, what it is that we are, are, are not going to allow. You know, in our Game B online home, for instance, uh, we have... Uh, you know, one death penalty rule, which is if you direct obscene language at another member, you will be terminated instantly, period, uh, as an example of a quorum rule, which we enforce. And it, it actually was named after a specific user who was, was, the, uh, was, was the cause for it. And so if we think about and the other thing about decorum is it's viewpoint neutral, uh, whether you're talking about Trump or whether you're talking about Bernie, uh, you can say so using decorum without attacking other people. If if the rules for this particular platform were safe, you you could use the George Carlin, no seven dirty words. I'd be out of luck because I don't know how to talk without using the seven dirty words. Uh, But one could imagine a platform that might choose to do that. Uh, You could talk about anything uh, with decorum. You know, I like to point out the Beatles never said fuck in any of their songs. Right. And yet they were pretty revolutionary dudes. Uh, and so you can, uh, you know, the quorum and then the other side content are two different worlds. If you make that divide cleanly, uh, I think you get rid of an awful lot of the confusion uh, that, uh, that the discussion around moderation has fa- falls into in the simplistic uh, all or nothing perspective. Yeah, but I would con- say it's likely to be, you know, uh, who knows whether there's actually a justification for this, but you might you might find that it's a Pareto, you know, you've nailed 80 percent of what people want protected versus what people want excluded with the single, you know, the single stroke. Now, uh, I want to take you to two places here. First off. There is bound to be some confusion. I have described myself as a free speech absolutist, but I am for a solution like the one you describe. And I would um, reconcile those two things in this way. In environments like those historically that have existed, one does not need absolute rules over decorum because they are effectively agreements in a community about what is and is not tolerable behavior. And they're obviously... Uh, you know, there's variation, but the basic point is certain things are outside of what this community typically tolerates, and um, one can certain simply infer those. And in fact, you might be very much in favor of those rules of decorum, as I am, and very much against absolute rules, you know, posted on the door that say what will happen to you if you violate this rule. The basic point is we don't want this to be authoritarian. We want it to be voluntary. And the point is, you can't have it be voluntary in a space like Twitter, right? We're not anywhere down near Dunbar's number. We're so many orders above it, or orders of magnitude above it, that what could be done informally in another context must be done formally at the level of something like Twitter. And so a free speech absolutist is not saying everybody should say everything that crosses their mind at all moments, right? What they are saying is that we want to be very careful Uh, not to create any limit that could potentially um, uh, eliminate some kind of of valuable perspective. We need to protect all sorts of speech that may not be obviously valuable in order to make sure to catch everything that is valuable. So... um, the, let me go on to the to the, the other distinctions, if you, if you don't mind. Yep. Uh, yeah. So decorum. And again, different sites will have different decorums. And, and um, I'll sort of finish up on what you were talking about. In a face to face community, it's generally speaking uh, implicit. And also, interestingly, you have skin in the game. If you're yes. in my face uh, talking about my mother, guess what? I might punch you in the nose. Right. Uh, yep. You know, uh, uh, somebody sitting in their mother's basement typing away on their computer uh, 3000 miles from nowhere. Uh, you don't have that skin in the game. And so well, you have two things. There's skin in the game, right? Like literally skin in the game. There's right? literally skin in the game. You might take a punch if you say the wrong thing. Um, there's also reputation, right? It is not so diluted by the number of users or the anonymity or any of these other features. Correct. Yeah, if you're um, part of a face-to-face community and you're known as the asshole that, you know, 
uh, just dishy shit to everybody. Nobody invites you to any events anymore. And they, and they cross the street when they see you coming, uh, you know, community of the Dunbar number of 150 plus or, you know, plus times two, maybe. Uh, so yeah. So now let's go on to the next distinction, which, uh, we have content versus decorum. And that's a pretty bright line. Yeah. There's a few edge cases, but if you stop and think, is this a decorum question or is this a content question? It's usually pretty clear. Uh, now in content, I have a, a second, uh, distinction uh, that's a little muddier, which is between uh, actually uh, bad, inherently bad content that, again, most everybody would agree is bad, though there'll be some corner cases. For instance, uh, uh, attacks on privacy, doxing, right? Uh, the uh, 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 the, advoc the advocacy of, vi of imminent violence against specific people or groups, uh, the advocacy for the uh, committing of serious crimes. Now, it's interesting. I make a distinction in the article about serious crimes because I uh, might well allow uh, advocacy for civil disobedience. Right. Uh, if people want to go out in the street and march without a permit and get arrested for blocking traffic. Uh, at least if I were designing the rules for Twitter, I would not rule that out. On the other hand, if I were if someone were to be advocating murder or uh, uh, bank robbery and you know in a very specific way, uh, we might roll that out. So uh, there are some are some judgment cases on there. And then the other content in this sense, dangerous content, inherently dangerous content uh, uh, would you know could include you know detailed descriptions of how to make bombs or poisons or how to kill yourself or things of that ilk. Uh, so that's that bundle and. Uh, you know, each, this, each system will make its own decisions about that. I'm reasonably confident Elon will come up with some reasonable uh, set of choices. They're probably more liberal than, than many people might, but it's, it's not going to be insane. It's the third bucket, it, which is what I believe Elon actually cares about and which could be so important to help our world become a better place. And that's what I call point of view moderation. Uh, and point of view means what is it that you are trying to deliver, that you are trying to say, the substance? Are you trying to say uh, capitalism bad, communism good? Are you trying to say trout fishing is more fun than bass fishing? You know, you have some substance that you're trying to deliver. And that's your point of view. And uh, my perspective, and I'm with you here, I'm pretty close to an uh, absolutist on good faith point of view. Uh, you know, as I uh, talk in the, I give an example in the uh, essay that uh, all the platforms ganged up simultaneously and booted the QAnon folks uh, in late 2020 and very early 2021. You know, frankly, I think the QAnon folks are ass clowns and the chances of their ideas being correct are essentially zero, uh, or at least mostly, most of their ideas are essentially zero. Uh, but then I, uh, as I said, I also say the same thing about Christianity, astrology, and Marxist-Leninism. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I don't consider the consider it right to ban those three just because I don't like them. Right. And I think they're false and I think they're bad. And that's, I do believe they're both false and bad. All three of them. Yeah. Uh, although but, I've heard you say and I agree that there are things in Marx's critique of the way capitalism functions that are well worth discussing. It's oh, sure. On, on and the, Jesus's Sermon on the Mount is a goddamn good set of moral lessons. Absolutely. Right. right. Uh, and so <laughs> so that's an important thing for those yeah, yeah. who, who uh, want a bright line to recognize is that in the case that something uh, has value, but it's not uh, all of one nature. How are you going to draw that line? And so yeah. what you're saying is you draw that line liberally because you I'm need to be able to hash it out. I mean, if it's good faith, if it's presented in good decorum, if it isn't obviously imminently dangerous and not in the kind of the new sense of safety bullshit, we can talk about that some. Uh, but, it, you know, uh, then let the ideas flow. And this is what I believe to be Elon's actual uh, motivation. And, you know, really hard for me to think about where in a point of view, uh, you know, one would stop. And, and again, this is to you, you were alluding to this earlier. Uh, yes, there's some bad ideas will float around. Uh, QAnon, Marxist-Leninism, let's just give, you know, two examples. Uh, but 
uh, the attempt to pick and choose amongst ideas inevitably leads to the squelching of these fresh shoots that we need. Uh, and I was in an email conversation with somebody today and they were going, blah, 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 democracy. Uh, if people were able to say whatever they want to be the end of democracy. And I pointed out to them, did you realize that when the American founding, democracy was a bad word? The founders went out of their way to say that what we, they had created was not a democracy. It was a mixed republic, which was actually true. It wasn't until 1800 or so when Jefferson and his uh, Democratic Republican Party got underway uh, that democracy even became something other than an embarrassing word. And very partisan newspapers campaigned democracy uh, for a number of years. And finally, democracy was more or less consolidated in uh, 1824 with the election that Andrew Jackson narrowly lost to John Quincy Adams. And so uh, the thing that he thought he was defending uh, democracy is actually a perfect example where upstart insurgents uh, waged mimetic warfare for 24 years before they actually consolidated the idea that America was a democracy. Uh, and so if we're allowing the, the peculiar oligarchs who control these platforms uh, to stomp on uh, fresh ideas, no telling what fresh ideas uh, might be uh, being stomped on. And I believe that it's the fresh ideas that are going to uh, save humanity and help guide us uh, toward, or help us navigate ourselves towards a better place uh, rather than, you know, the old tired uh, ideological ideas from the 18th, 19th and 20th century. And so truthfully at bottom, that's why I'm a point of view near absolutist is that I'm so afraid that, uh, you know, reflexive defense of the status quo ends up killing the ideas that we're going to need to save ourselves. And putting up with some bad ideas in circulation is a price worth paying uh, to be able to harvest the fruits of those fresh little sprouts when they grow up. Yeah, this is uh, an issue near and dear to my heart on many different fronts, right? This is something that is now happening in the realm of science. It's obviously happening in our political discussions. And once you spot the following puzzle, it's obvious that you can't go, go about this the way we're doing it. The puzzle is the fringe is mostly garbage. It is therefore reasonable. If, if you wanted to get an algorithm to bet on things, just simply reflexively betting against the fringe, is a winner in general, but it's not a very big winner. And what it does is it guarantees that you will neuter all of the things on which progress is based. In other words, all of the status quo stuff that works arose on the fringe and it became exactly. mainstream. And so effectively, this reflexive betting against the fringe, the dismissing of everyone on the fringe as a kook or a crank or a quack or whatever is the end of progress. Right. This is um, it is beyond conservative. It is reactionary and it doesn't matter which side it's coming from. That's just its nature. And in fact, it's coming from uh, self-interest, people who are trying to protect themselves from competitors who have yet to have risen will, you know, invoke this need to do quality control of the fringe because there's so much garbage there. But the point is, you know, the founding fathers were fringe. Right. Now yeah, right, they were. The Enlightenment was fringe right. in 1725, right? Science was considered heretical, literally. People were burned at the stake or uh, imprisoned for life. Galileo spent the last years of his life under house arrest for being the first real scientist. Right. So it's, it's effectively, you know, are you for or against explosions? Well, I guess in general, I don't want explosions, but, you know, internal combustion engines run on explosions. So if I rule out explosions, I've caused a problem. And, you know, in this case, we have to protect the fringe, even though we also have to acknowledge that it is true. Most of what is on the fringe is garbage in every era. That's always been true. And the thing that has never been solved is how you can go to the fringe and sort between that which is ahead of its time and that which is truly nonsense. Right. And our complexity lens would tell us you can't. You can't. Right? It can't because be done. Because the unfolding of a complex system is unpredictable very many steps out. So, you know, something wackadoodle like game B, right? Uh, is that the answer? I think it is. But 
Truthfully, can I prove it? Hell no. And the only way you're going to find out is to watch the world unfold. Either Game B will change the world for the good or it'll disappear. Right. right. And in and some sense, I mean, I, you know, I hate to say the sentence because I know that it will potentially invite all kinds of nonsense. But I think you and I would both agree that, in effect, in order to protect something potentially important like Game B, you also have to protect nonsense like QAnon. Exactly. Right. That was the point I was trying to make. Yep. If your job is to, if, if your reflex, if you're and even worse on Facebook, where they actually write algorithms to do this, uh, if your algorithms essentially are targeting anything that is anti-status quo, uh, as you'll say, we'll never have progress. This is what happened to China, interestingly, uh, in the late Ming era, where they had the biggest ships in the world. They went as far as uh, uh, Cape of Good Hope. Uh, and then they got their, their institutions got captured by this hyper reactionaryism. They burned all the uh, treasure ships and they basically fell into centuries of uh, passive nothingness and then had their butts kicked when the Europeans and the Japanese uh, emerged uh, and collided with them in the late 18th and early 19th century. And only now have they recovered. And uh, you know, so it, that can happen to a society. It can just say, no change, no change. And yes, that, in, that's a prescription for disaster. In fact, my understanding of that chunk of history is that it is very likely, maybe even near certain, uh, that if the Chinese had not uh, done that, that uh, instead of the Europeans showing up in the Americas, it would have been the Chinese and it would have changed the history of the world. Um, so anyway, yes, we, we, we need to be incredibly cautious about um, imagining that any rule of thumb is good enough to deal with the problem of a fringe that is mostly garbage, but is also the incubator for all of the most important ideas of the future that none of us can spell out yet. Right. And, and to just speak to your own field, uh, as we know, the vast preponderance of mutations are bad. Uh, right. The vast, I don't know if you pick a number, 99.9. Right. Uh, but guess what? We'd still be single cell uh, bacteria or archaea if it wasn't for mutations. Yep. Right. Um, so. All right. We've got a bunch of stuff here. I did want to mention that you talk about um, the question of doxing and you deal with that, I believe, according to what you've just said as a form of content that does not need to be protected. Whereas I would say that in the case of doxing, actually you can deal with that by saying this is a violation of decorum, but you can't, there is no place to put the decorum line that does the full work, right? So for example, uh, let's just take uh, a, a real life example here. I um, retweeted a clip of a speech that I had delivered on video at the anti-mandate rally in Los Angeles uh, last month. Or maybe it was the beginning of this month. In any case, in that clip, I argued that um, we are effectively faced with questions that were settled at Nuremberg, and we are now unsettling those questions. And that in fact, these mandates, because um, we have not been given uh, full information on the consequences of things like these vaccines. They are a violation of our right to informed consent, and therefore the orders to administer these things are immoral and must be rejected. So there are two violations of Nuremberg in the one case of mandates. Now, we can argue about whether or not I'm correct in my interpretation. But nonetheless, what I have effectively said is that we are morally required to um, reject what may be lawful orders to administer a mandate that violates the informed consent of patients. Now, is that a case of me advocating to break the law? Is that equivalent of me suggesting that someone should rob a bank? Or is this me actually saying, that as a settled matter um, of moral principle, we all recognized until five minutes ago that we were required to ignore immoral orders, to reject them in favor of a higher principle, right? So the question is, this now puts us in a, you know, a gray area. Um, anybody who recognizes the importance of Nuremberg is not going to want some algorithm to regard that as me advocating the breaking of uh, some law as if I've argued that you should, you know, drive 150 miles an hour through a school zone. Right. 
Um, but there is a question to be adjudicated, right? Is that's, a, that's a good that's a good uh, test case, actually. And it's one that, you know, the, uh, the answer to me is instinctually obvious that yep. uh, it's it smells to me very much the same as uh, being allowed to advocate for civil disobedience. Right. Uh, which you say that uh, in civil dis- disobedience, whatever the uh, minor social costs are for minor criminal activity, like blocking a street uh, or even building a bonfire in the middle of the street, uh, the uh, the ability to, to speak truth to power uh, is worth taking on small Uh, costs of criminal infractions. And uh, in this case, I say very similar, again, the whatever crimes that you're advocating for, they're not violent. They're not predatory. Uh, They're essentially what they call malum in se, uh, uh, malum proper hebrum versus malum in se. That's an interesting distinction in the law. Malum in se are laws that any sane person would agree should be illegal. Murder, robbery, arson, rape, assault, that kind of stuff. Uh, 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 pro- in prohibum uh, is uh, laws that are essentially regulatory and that societies will differ on, right? Uh, failure to file your Federal Election Commission report on time is actually a felony good for five years in the United States at the current time. Uh, you know, the founding fathers would have thought that was utterly absurd. And in most countries around the world, they don't have such things. So that's a, a classic prohibum style law. Uh, so perhaps there, you know, there we go. Talking out loud, thinking, doing real thinking, as our friend Jordan would say, as opposed to simulated thinking. Uh, a first cut would be uh, malum in se laws at the felony level uh, should not be uh, permitted, uh, but to advocate breaking a regulatory law that humans in general don't agree is a crime, uh, maybe that's okay. Yeah. Yep. So uh, I would also point out, I think to me, one of the most interesting things in your article was, you know, it's it's classic Jim Rutt. It's also classic Game B. People will find some analogy in it between what you've done and and the structure of the Unity 2020 proposal. But in your article, you propose a an adjudication mechanism that solves many of the problems that many people would throw up their hands at. Right. If you're going to, you know, we've got a basic decorum versus content distinction. Right. We're going to enforce some rules of decorum because the harm of doing so is very, very small. But somebody's going to have to decide whether a given violation is decorum or content. And then within content, we're going to have to have uh, adjudication of whether or not something like the case that I've just presented is within the scope of tolerated behavior on Twitter or outside of the bounds. Right. So how are you going to do that? Are you going to have some gigantic structure, a Baroque court system inside of Twitter? How could it be paid for? How do you keep it from being abused in the way that our court systems in the outside world are frequently abused? So anyway, do you want to describe the structure that you propose? Yes. uh, Yeah, that's great, because I do think this is important because anything has to be able to scale at a reasonable price. Right. Uh, And so what I propose is first, whatever the rules are on a platform, they need to be laid out very much like the criminal law, which is with sections, numbered sections and numbered paragraphs, uh, you know, 12.4.3. Right. That's the uh, that's the crime of picking a pocket, let's say. And that uh, the bottom level, the leaf on these trees should be no more than 100 words and it should be write, written in plain English. Uh, that's the starting point. You know, if, if law is not comprehensible, uh, you, you can't hold people accountable uh, for obeying it. Second, any moderation uh, uh, action of any sort, including warnings, must uh, specify the exact post in question and must uh, quote, the exact section that you are in violation of. Uh, and it is true that that may have to be done algorithmically at times. However, uh, those algorithms will fail at a pretty high rate. And so all algorithmic moderation must be appealable to a human within 24 hours. Uh, and then that's the first level of appeal. And then this, the second level of appeal, I think, is the one that is really necessary for producing the healthy ecosystem. And it's something I came up with and I'm pretty proud of it actually, uh, which is if you've been rejected by your human right of appeal against the algorithm, uh, you can uh, take your case uh, to arbitration. 
uh, with third party from American Arbitration Association certified arbitrators. And I've used them before in, in, in a business at scale around domain squatting of all obscure shit, where we basically had a, a relationship with an army of arbitrators and they arbitrated the cases and it worked. Uh, they're not perfect, but they're way better than an internal bureaucracy with all of its self-serving tendencies. And so this is what would happen. Uh, I'm not happy with my human appeal from the, uh, you know, the $13 an hour staffer at Twitter. So I say, I'm going to arbitration and here's how arbitration works. Uh, you put up a hundred dollars or more, uh, in, you, uh, the uh, ostensible violator. Yeah, me, the violator, uh, put up $100 minimum or more, and I appeal. And the arbitration is what's called baseball arbitration in the art of uh, arbitration, which is the arbitrator may not split the baby. They must decide either A or B. Either the, the, the tweet or comment uh, violates that 100 word or less uh, statute, or it does not, A or B. It has to be brisk. And arbitrators know how to do this. A fair amount of arbitration is structured as baseball arbitration. And now here's the two clever parts. If uh, you find for the platform, the uh, appellant, the user loses their stake, let's say they're $100. Uh, and that $100, if it's only $100, goes to pay for the arbitrator. Uh, on the other hand, if the uh, platform loses and the uh, baseball arbitration is found for the uh, complainer, the user, they get 10x the money from the platform. So I put up a hundred bucks uh, and if uh, the arbitrator finds in my favor, I get a thousand dollars from Twitter. And now a step further, uh, for uh, many people, hundred dollars is really too much. And further, a hundred thousand dollars is not enough of a penalty for really bad behavior. Uh, so I uh, provided in this plan to, for stakes to be as large as a million dollars, right? Uh, and so worst case, platforms paying 10 million when they're wrong. And further, very important that there's a marketplace, the ability for anybody who think they've been done wrong by the platform to post uh, their appeal and syndicate it, meaning that a community of, frankly, some of them just going to be sharky financial dudes, right? They're going to look at the uh, the the tweet, they're going to look at the uh, mandated hundred word statute and they're going to say, that doesn't apply. Fuck, I'm going to back this bet, right? And uh, if they back the bet, uh, the backers will get 80% of the win in the case that the uh, appealer prevails and the appealer gets 20%. So he has an upside uh, if he can uh, get his appeal uh, syndicated. Let's say he gets $10,000 worth of uh, backers uh, and uh, he wins, uh, gets paid out $100,000. Uh, he, the appellant, gets $20,000 for not doing anything except appealing an injustice. Uh, and so the net emergent result uh, is that anybody can get justice. Uh, the justice is self-liquidating in terms of its cost. Uh, the deciders are independent and professional deciders uh, who are not under the thumb of, uh, of Twitter. And the American Arbitration Association does a great job of protecting their arbitrators from any kind of recourse from, the, uh, from either side in the operation. Uh, and because of the 10 to 1 leverage, uh, the platforms uh, will lose their ass if they're not right 90% of the time. Uh, and so I look at this, this combination of, of force fields, which this proposal creates, and I just feel really good about this, that uh, people will now feel that moderation is transparent, as we know the rules, we can read them, they're in plain English. Uh, when we... Uh, uh, when they claim we violated the rules, not well, you have violated our terms of service. I mean, that's what most of these things are. These are, you violate terms of service. You go to Facebook terms of service, 64 pages of gobbledygook, right? Uh, but if they have to quote the exact hundred words, which, uh, which correspond to this exact post, then you can understand what you allegedly did wrong. You can make the decision whether uh, you feel like you have been done an injustice. And if you have been, you can appeal. You can make some money off it and make them pay. And we all know one of the human senses of justice is to inflict a penalty on people who do you harm. Right. So one of the things that keeps coming up in the uh, research on deep human nature, that punishing evildoers is something that uh, humans actually uh, like to do, even above and beyond the uh, uh, the rewards that might come from it. So that's my that's my proposal, which I think if you implemented it on something like Twitter uh, would revolutionize uh, both people's attitudes about moderation and uh, the actual goodness of the result. 
All right, so let me give you a couple observations on this. One, doesn't have to be professional arbiters. It could be. I like your structure. I think it would be useful. But you could also source this work from inside the community in various ways. Um, also, doesn't have to be individuals. You know, it could be that certain cases are important enough that you would want to have more eyes and a, a debate process inside the adjudication. The structure as you propose it, and I know you're going to agree with this. Uh, I'll be surprised if you don't. Let's put it that way. I mean, I, I will be surprised if you disagree. Is the structure as you've laid it out is a great prototype. Were you to implement it, you would almost certainly discover that the parameters are set incorrectly, right? That you could get away, uh, you know, that either the process is uh, too likely to bar certain kinds of people from getting important things adjudicated because they don't have the hundred bucks or aren't likely to risk it and their uh, case isn't likely to garner the attention of somebody who's waiting for a particularly golden version or who knows. But the point is, the parameters as laid out are likely not to be right. They're a good first guess, but we don't know what the right parameters are until you've run it. So what you want is a system in which that can evolve and the fine tuning of the system so it works maximally efficiently, covers the maximum number of cases and does so reasonably well, you know, comes out uh, in the wash. I also believe that there needs to be a feedback between this process and I will argue, I did argue on Twitter this morning, that there needs to be a bill of rights, right? Now, the bill of rights should spell out what the intent of the various per provisions are. And so as the system of adjudication that you've laid out gets refined, it will also reveal ambiguities in the terms of service and the bill of rights for users. And so that feedback can be used to refine those things so that any ambiguities get wrung out of the system so that the, uh, uh, you know, unspotted problems get introduced in uh, in some formal way and then the parameters around them get refined. And this could all be done, must all be done transparently so that people can discuss the process. They can discuss the moral hazards that may arise, et cetera, et cetera. So those uh, inter, uh, interacting feedbacks can both refine the adjudication and uh, the structure of the effective laws that are being, uh, laws or standards that are being adjudicated. Yep, I like uh, uh, quite a bit of this. I'll, I'll go through the parts I like, and then the one part that I considered what you proposed and rejected it. Okay. Uh, uh, first, I love the idea of a Bill of Rights, right? You know, in the same sense that the Founding Fathers forgot to add a Bill of Rights to the Constitution, uh, the uh, Madisonians, Jeffersonians demanded it, and they got it. Uh, so I think that's a wonderful idea, and that should be one of the basis on which you appeal, which is, uh, you know, not only did I not violate uh, Rule 12.3.4, but 12.3.4 violates the Seventh Amendment yep. of, uh, of Twitter. And either of those would be would be ground for the arbitrator uh, to find against it. And of course, uh, Twitter pays out ten thousand dollars to somebody because they uh, an arbitrator found a, a rule was unconstitutional. Uh, they're going to change that rule damn quick. Otherwise, people are going to mine the shit out of that. Right. So that's uh, uh, that's, I think, uh, a, a very uh, good, uh, good idea. You're, of course, you're correct. I mean, you know, of course, you're correct. The parameters uh, that I propose are not the correct ones. They're the ones I made up when I wrote the. The essay, right? They're a good yeah. first guess. Yeah, they're not terrible, but of course they're going to change, right? It'll turn out probably that a million dollars is too high. Maybe the cap should be ten thousand uh, dollars, something like that. Uh, hard to see how you get professional arbitration for much less than a hundred dollars on a consistent basis. Maybe get to fifty, but uh, at scale. But it, you know, if you're going to use a uh, professional arbitration, uh, you're going to have to have the minimum of a hundred. Uh, and now I, I am sympathetic to the issue about, you know, let's say about the kid in Nigeria who makes, you know, five dollars a day. He can't come up with one hundred dollars. Uh, but that's where I perhaps have more confidence in rapacious investors. Right. Uh, you know, that if there are, uh, you know, there, there is money to be made, especially the cap is ten thousand dollars. And you uh, can find a, a kid in Nigeria who was done injustice by. Uh, who's posted his claim, uh, there will be sharks. They'll be looking for those things. This is injustice. I'm putting the whole 10 grand down. I'm going to win 
$80,000 if I'm right. And I believe that, uh, um, in fact, all I have to be right is 12% of the time, right? Uh, so this, I, I guess I'm a, enough of a market purist in some sense uh, that I have more confidence that a marketplace in syndicated appeals will actually work pretty good. All right, I, I dig it, but then we got to go one more step. Well, Maybe let me, the, before we do that, oh, okay. we'll come back to it. Let me finish yep. up on the one part that I considered and rejected. Uh, you didn't quite say it explicitly, but you alluded to it. Uh, which is maybe there's other ways to adjudicate these cases than uh, third-party ar arbitration. And one that I used to love, and I used to actually propose this, uh, is automatically selected juries of users for this sort of thing. And I actually, as I started to write the article, I actually wrote that in. Then I was stopped and thought about it. What would happen if you did that? And I realized there's a flaw in it, unfortunately, because it's a great idea. And for years, I've advocated it. And here's the flaw that I saw. Unfortunately, societies today are highly, highly tribalized, knee-jerk tribalism. Uh, so if you, let's, let's say, and this was my, going to be my proposal, that, uh, you know, a, a decorum, a decor, particularly decorum violations would, would go, that were low stakes. So the worst that could happen to you was the content was taken down or maybe a three-day suspension. So anything, uh, you know, low, relatively low stakes would go to a randomly selected of currently active users of 10 of them uh, and to make the same call as the arbitrator. Uh, and if, you know, somebody who was, pick didn't make the call. The algorithm would keep sending it to people until 10 of them had voted. And if eight voted against you, you lost, right? Uh, now, uh, unfortunately, humans being the way they are, especially today, suppose I, uh, you know, say Donald Trump is a motherfucker, right? And it's against the rules to say motherfucker. People hate Donald Trump are going to say that's not a violation, right? Uh, and so uh, uh, motivated reasoning would triumph over careful application of the rules. And therefore, I rejected my own idea uh, as I was writing the article. Well, I reject your rejection of your own idea, Jim. Uh, okay, let's, let's hear it. Bring let's it, see, if, let's it. see if I can't resurrect it. Okay, um, let's do it. All uh, right. well, that, was, that was what you were alluding to was my guess. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Well, here's the thing. A, a, I think it's such a good idea that I don't want the tribalism objection to kill it, but I totally recognize your point is that basically if all you're doing is subjecting a particular question to the arbitrary process of how many people, you know, you know of whether you picked one person from this side or that side of the puzzle. Um, but here's the thing. I do hope and I think it is imperative that Musk um, makes transparent whatever algorithmic stuff is affecting who we interact with and how we view them and all of that. Um, but it is also true that the algorithms are in a position to figure out who is um, not subject to those tribal dynamics. In other words, I don't know what the algorithm thinks about you and I don't know what it thinks about me, but I bet it's confused. Right. I would say most yeah. likely it would have to be because the point is you get into a level of a la carte uh, evaluations of things and every, you know, beyond some level, everybody's one off. And yeah, big data can overcome some of that. But anyway, my point is the algorithms are in a position or at least the, the data matrix is in a position to identify people who are in a good position to adjudicate these things, people who, you know. Um, people who uh, have a consistent history of nuance in some area that makes their position somewhat unpredictable from a, a machine perspective could be found. And so it could even become, uh, you know, a badge of honor. In other words, to be spotted as somebody who is capable of adjudicating these things could be an indication that you're actually a nuanced, independent thinker. And that could be a badge of honor which would then incentivize people to get off their tribal shit, which would be good for society. So anyway, somewhere in that neighborhood might be a solution to the, the uh, hazard you rightly point out as a sizable one. Interesting. That's, uh, and, and here's a way to tell if you're right. Uh, and a company the size of Twitter with uh, Elon Musk's billions could do this, which is at some substantial scale, big enough that it was statistically significant, do both in parallel. Yep. In other words, and if the uh, yeah, yeah, they, A/B test it. 
yeah, A-B test it, have the arbitrators do it. We can have pretty high reliability that arbitrators are good. There's a lot of literature on that. They're not perfect, but yep. they're good. And if it turns out that finding these untriggered uh, people, these people who are not tribal in their dis- decisions or have the intellectual fortitude to override their tribalism. And I do know people like that, uh, you know, that my mother was a famously fair person. You know, I would uh, put my life on the line if my mother was on a jury. She was somehow able to get her tribal alliances, which were quite strong, uh, and put them aside when she was making a judgment, right? But uh, how it. you find that with a computer algorithm, I don't know. But, uh, it, but we could test it, right? Okay. Brett and his gang of renown uh, create or evolve, most likely from machine learning, uh, uh, you know, a proposed mechanism. And then we run it in parallel with the arbitrators. And if it doesn't beat the arbitrators, we don't adopt it. If, when it can consistently uh, equal the arbitrators, uh, then maybe we'll consider it. We will consider it. We will adopt it. Uh, so now with respect to this other thing that you alluded to, we might as well go on to this, which is uh, the algorithms and transparency. And this is something that uh, I believe Elon has gotten almost right, uh, which is he suggested that the feed algorithm be made open source. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, because as most people know, uh, you don't see all the tweets of your friends in their time order in which they were made. You used to on both Facebook and Twitter, but it's been many years. And frankly, an awful lot of their money uh, comes from uh, feeding you clickbait and things that will keep you on and drive engagement, et cetera. And nobody knows what those algorithms do. They're magic, right? And you know, people think they've been shadow banned. For instance, shadow banning is the idea that based on the content or, or you or something, they uh, feed less of your stories uh, to people who follow you. I've occasionally been fairly convinced I've been, been shadow banned for periods yeah, of time. You have to be careful because there are multiple patterns. One pattern I've seen, which uh, you will spot right away why it exists, is that when you take a break from Twitter, Twitter is very tepid on your tweets at the point that you return, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, that's very true. And as somebody who takes a six month sabbatical from social media every year, uh, it does take a while to warm the org- uh, algorithms up when I get back. Right, which I take to be effectively punishment to keep addicts on, right? It's very addictive. You know, when my tweets are, you know, regularly getting 4,000, 6,000, 8,000 likes and then i take a break for a week and i come back and i you know stuff isn't getting seen it trains me actually those breaks for a week aren't so good for you brett and um anyway it's yeah, a, it basically makes a lot of sense a lot huge amount of sense and god damn is does that suck right god damn <laughs> does that suck and the thing is i can't even swear i mean i'll bet you that they understand what they're doing but it's the kind of thing that if they have a learning algorithm what you know what biases cause people to remain engaged on twitter it will discover the pattern of how to punish somebody who's trying to control their addiction and it will generate that algorithm so yeah, this, this is- algorithm generates more actual views than that algorithm the management may not even know that right. it's, it has this feature and in fact that's one of the dangers of black box machine learning black box machine learning is damn useful for certain things but for things like this uh with no transparency in it uh, it can produce very bad unanticipated questions. I never thought of that. But that's, you're exactly right. That's got to be true. I mean, uh, especially the guys who are growing massive machine learning, which are mostly Facebook and Google. I guarantee either intentionally or unintentionally, uh, they are punishing people who stop shooting up the heroin. And uh, if you want to if you want to be a paperclip, that's the thing to root for. That's the thing that's going to get you turned into a paperclip faster than anything else is these black boxes where the people who made them don't know why they work. Right. But they because work. They on, work. The, on the metric they were given, you know, so, yep. oh, we want lots of paperclip. You will get a whole bunch of paperclips, <laughs> motherfucker. But anyway, now back to my solution on where, yep. uh, on where I think uh, he's half right or uh, 60% right. Uh, the, uh, that feed algorithm ought to be uh, uh, open source. Not that, uh, you know, I was talking to my wife about this and she's a very smart person, but she's not a software person. She said, I don't know what I would do with that. Well, you don't need to do anything with it. There are professional critics out there who will evaluate the software and they'll say, oh, look at this. It's done just what Brett said. The motherfuckers, they punish you if you go on break. Uh, and then everybody would know it and, cr- and start complaining and maybe they'd fix it. Uh, but the other the downside is it would also provide lots of clues for how to game the algorithm. 
Yeah. And, and I, that's not good. So here's my response to that. Here's my solution, uh, which is, all right, let's have a market in feed algorithms and they're all required to be open source and uh, and you can charge up to 10 cents a month to somebody to subscribe uh, to your feed algorithm and they're all open source and 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 more important and also very importantly uh the architecture of facebook uh does not or you other users do not know what algorithm you're running, so they don't know how to game you. So suddenly the uh, the gaming of the algorithms problem becomes exponentially more difficult. And so I think you get the power of open source algorithms, you get innovation in algorithms, which itself is a pure good, and you get a dense and complicated ecosystem, which is very difficult to game. Yeah, but there's a big danger in that, Jim. You know, if you take I that know, too I know, I know far, there are some, da- uh, there are some dangers. Let's well, hear but this is like the mother of all dangers, right? If you take that thinking too far, you could end up saving Western civilization, right? I'd hate for that to happen. I know. Wouldn't that be terrible? Yeah, because if people had too much insight into the way they were being manipulated and started to understand why other people see things the way that they do, then they would be much harder to fool, right? Mm-hmm. And actually, so this is my my elaboration of that idea. As it happens, I was working with some other folks about what to do about the collapse of all of our platforms, which may not matter because Elon may be in the process of rescuing Twitter. And if he does, that will change the dynamics for the rest of the, you know, if the rest of the social media platforms are like the kiddie pool and Twitter is like a place that adults can go and have any conversation that needs to be had, then Twitter is going to be the only place anybody wants to be. So that's going to change what the other platforms do. This is an extension of my zero as a special number uh, claim. But uh, anyway, one of the things that I think uh, is true, um, you know, and this is a response to Celia's point about not knowing what to do with the algorithm if even if it was open is I don't even think that that's right, because one of the things you might build in is a it could be sliders, right, where you could just play with them and see how your view of the world changes as you move yourself from Twitter thinks I'm a liberal to Twitter thinks I'm a conservative or something like that. Um, But you could also there's all kinds of fun things you could do, right? Hey, you know, Brett Weinstein sounds crazy to me. I cannot understand how a smart person would reach the conclusions that he seems to have reached about, for example, COVID public health policy. Let me see the world as Brett sees it for a week, right? Then maybe you'll understand a few things, right? Now, if you could do that, if you could say, look, I want to see what my opposite, you know, take every parameter that describes me and flip them all the other direction. What does that person see on Twitter? Now this begins to empower us as citizens to understand the crazy world we've landed in, right? I think I this could this. be, this, and this I, I have I have wondered about this for oh, at least a decade. Why is Why is there not a cottage industry of people trying to reverse engineer moment to moment, the content of these algorithms so that we can, you know, put a corrective lens on them and stop seeing through some, you know, Baroque structures desired viewpoint, right? Why are we... There is an industry, right? It's people who are basically trying to promote stuff, right? The influencer Ah. type stuff. It's all about, uh, you know, how to game the algorithms. There's a giant industry in how to game the algorithms. True, but there's no public spirited effort to allow you to correct for the algorithm's uh, impact on you. So anyway, the point is, look, if you give users the ability to play with the parameters, see what other people see, right, that could potentially be a game changer with respect to how we understand each other. Yeah, I love that. And I love that. And you combine that with the, with the marketplace idea, because uh, that way there would be innovation in these sliders, right? Okay, what kind of, sl- not just right and left, that's kind of stupid. How about open-minded versus closed-minded? How about neurotic versus anti-neurotic, right? Uh, you know, you could, sl- you could have all kinds of interesting ideas. Uh, or, you know, or again, someone could actually put, I want to look, I want to look at the world the way Kim Kardashian looks at it for 30 right. seconds before I went insane. Right. Uh, and and uh, there'll be lots of innovation in the features around feeds. So but I love your idea. I, frankly, I've never thought about that. That's a that's a great one. I'm stealing that. And I'll give, and <laughs> awesome. I'll give credit when I remember that Brett Weinstein said that we should uh, have 
sliders on our feed owl goals and uh, be able to switch uh, shoes with other people and see the world from their, that alone, see the world from their perspective for even if it's just an hour would be really quite valuable. Oh my God, it would be so great. And you can imagine, you know, the podcasts that are just waiting to happen. Somebody runs an experiment, right? What, you know, I, I lived for a week in Jesse's singles shoes, right? Let me tell you what I learned about the difference in our perspective. There's so much room, you know, for us to become sort of like next level conscious of our collective consciousness that uh, it's it's hard to imagine how it wouldn't be uh, invigorating and tremendously insightful. Yeah, as the, uh, you know, the big heads say, multi-perspectival, right? Literally, mm-hmm. you'd have an opportunity to be multi-perspectival. I could look at the world as Brett sees it. I could look at the world as Kim Kardashian sees it. I could look at the way, heaven forbid, Trump sees it. And uh, <laughs> that would be educational for short periods of time. It sure uh, would. And, and that's really hard to do. You know, it's hard. To, it's impossible to do in a face-to-face world other than through empathy. Uh, and But this is literally a place where our technology could provide us a capacity we never had before. Totally could. And for a troublemaker like Elon Musk, this is, I think, a natural, right? Hey, Elon, give us a call. <laughs> we'll tell you how to do it. Right? Well, actually, that, that does raise a question, right? Which is, um, you know, you've been thinking about this stuff forever. Game B was an explicit effort to figure out if we could get ourselves out of, you know, the, uh, the eddy that we were being flushed down to some new kind of self-governance that wasn't coercive and accomplished all of the things that it needs to accomplish and was resistant to capture and all of the things that we understood Game B to be about. There is a question about whether or not if this was, if it sounded like this style of thinking was of the right sort to figure out what to do with a property like Twitter that has huge potential to do both good and ill, right? Uh, He could create a council and you know we could figure it out and if we didn't figure it out he could chuck us yeah we could buy buy, buy his fancy dinners for uh you know uh, here's an idea you know uh, three-day weekends every six weeks for a while right that was the pattern we used to cook up the emancipation party in game b and then when he decides we're not getting any value no more free dinners gentlemen and uh, i think we could cook up something for him yeah i'm pretty confident of it i think so all the people you and i know together uh you know we've been thinking about this stuff in a way more nuanced way because i do warn i do I, i do worry about that i do think that even Elon and his move taking over Twitter has an opportunity to break the monopoly of these goddamn Silicon Valley blue church uh, discourse chokers. But I also think that there is a chance he could fuck it up really, really bad and actually make things worse. And it's really important that he gets some good advice because he's a brilliant guy. But I I made this point also online today. It's kind of weird jumping back into social media after, you know, uh, almost a month being away from it. Cause I had, I did say when I went on sabbatical that I would come back to post my post, uh, my podcast uh, episodes, which my producer actually does. So I don't have to dirty my fingers with the filthy environment of social media. But I also said I would do it when I posted essays. And so I did hop back in today. One of the things I uh, uh, made uh, the point on was that Elon, as someone said, Elon, well, Elon Musk can figure this out. He's brilliant. And I go, yeah, he's motherfucking brilliant. But let's look at all the problems he solved. They all live in the realm of the complicated. Uh, they're engineering problems. You know, the, uh, even SpaceX, which is magnificent, huge scale engineering, is still engineering. And when, when we say something is complicated, we means we can take it apart, put it back together again, and it will still work. Uh, Twitter is in the re- is in the realm of the complex. Yep, uh, it's basically networks. It's nonlinear. It's humans. It's game theory. It's a agentic game theory, the worst kind. And uh, unlike the complicated, you can't take complex systems apart, put them back together again, and they'll work. They just, they're just different. And so I would put up as a finger up saying, yeah, Elon Musk is an extremely impressive guy in the land of the complicated, uh, but he has uh, really no expertise at all in the land of the complex. And while I believe he's so smart, uh, he could learn how to use that lens. He needs some lens makers for the realm of the complex. I absolutely agree. And, um, you know, that's a it's such an important distinction because to almost everybody, complex and complicated 
sound like synonyms, right? And until you spot the uh, huge distinction and its implications for something like this, because whether you like it or not, um, Twitter is a living dynamic, you know, with I don't know how many Presumably it's billions of users. Hundreds of of billions, hundreds of millions, hundreds of millions, hundreds of millions of users, each of which is a complex system in and of itself, which virtually guarantees that the interreaction, if it's anything other than stupidly simple, uh, is going to be a uh, a highly complex, complex system. Yeah, each one's going to be not only complex adaptive system, but it's going to be strategic, which adds a whole nother level to the analysis as it turns out. Yep. So anyway, yes, uh, whether it's complex systems is your fundamental bent or evolutionary biology, you definitely need some, uh, you know, at the very least, you need people who know that they don't know the solution and that you're going to have to basically use an evolutionary dynamic to solve any problem and that you will discover, uh, you know, unending unintended consequences along that road and they will have to be dealt with in real time. Um, that that is a, a fundamental piece of the puzzle. Yeah, which is very different than building a Tesla car, or even more so, a rocket, where you have to be extremely disciplined. Right? Yeah, extremely disciplined thinking could lead you into disaster in Twitterland. Uh, you're going to have to be adaptive in near real time, as you say, much like we talked about anti-utopianism. Uh, you're nudging Twitter in better directions. I actually closed out my essay with that point, uh, which is uh, anyone who thinks that. Any group of people, but specifically Elon, is going to get it right and do it perfectly from the beginning? No fucking way. Uh, The best we can hope for is that we'll be moving in the right direction and doing more smart things than we are stupid things. And that uh, rejecting Elon because he's not perfection uh, is the classic example of giving up the good for the perfect. And uh, and again, on the other hand, it, with Elon without the right guidance might not even be good. But I think there's a good chance that uh, particularly if they can find wise folks like you and me to give him advice, uh, the this will be a massive improvement over uh, having our ideas uh, of the green shoots of these new important ideas being stomped on uh, by the peculiar oligarchs of Silicon Valley. Uh, and I, I think this will be great, but uh, we'll see. Well, let's put it this way. Um, I, you know, I said on Twitter the other day that this could be a disaster, but I would bet strongly in the other direction because I do. Uh, um, I, I am a, a believer that Elon uh, has interesting instincts and he's very good at problem solving. And so he's going to spot the part of this that uh, nobody is equipped to handle yet. I I will say in your essay, you point to his, it's not really a Ted talk. It's a conversation on the Ted channel. Um, And I only got a short way into it before I had to, to put it on pause, but I was struck because he is explaining in there why so the question was some of your predictions have been almost uh strangely spot on but other ones have been way off why the distinction and the one that was used as the exemplar for why are you way off sometimes was when are we going to get uh fully autonomous cars and what he describes is a series of uh diminishing returns curves stacked on each other. He calls them false horizons. Um, And I was struck because uh, this is actually an image from uh, Heather and my book. Um, We went looking for versions of this image. This is an idea I came up with uh, years ago as I was working on trade-offs, which was my my dissertation. Um, And I realized that there was a parameter that was causing Uh, certain patterns to emerge in nature and it has a very different effect in for example academia where it causes fields to get stuck right which is a pattern most people aren't familiar with they sort of think there's always progress going on because there are always papers being published but that's not how it goes and there's a very good reason for it but anyway I was struck by the fact that he was effectively describing uh, this figure in our book which uh we you know made great pains to construct we couldn't just find a version of it somewhere because it didn't exist i'll tell Um, you where it does exist which is in the uh sfi and flavored study of innovation 
uh, what we have found is that innovation is a whole se- uh, is a stack of S curves uh, at various scales. And one of the ones that uh, the people at Sanofi Institute have studied uh, more than most others is uh, machine generated motion. Uh, or actually motion in general. Uh, uh, so you start out with a ho- walking, then you get a horse and it like, then it tops off. The best Arabian horse uh, is only a bit better than a sort of half-assed horse you buy for $10, right? Uh, and that, but it S's out. Horse ain't going no faster than the best horse in the world. Uh, and then you get a steam engine, right? You get a simple steam engine that's not optimized thermodynamically. It can't go faster than about 30 miles an hour tops out. Then someone comes up with a new innovation. Then there's another S curve. And if you look at the history of transport, uh, it's S curve after S curve after S curve with uh, middle uh, innovations like the more efficient condensers on the steam engines uh, to totally radically new ideas like diesel, then diesel electric, and then gas turbine, then jets, and then rockets. And those are all separate S's. Uh, and right. so there, there's where you, I think you can find this idea laid out in some considerable detail. Right. But the point is you can also extrapolate from it, right? If you know that that's the process you're involved in and you're on your first S curve, then you behave differently than if you think, finally, we figured out how to do this. And then you're deeply into diminishing returns before you ever decide to do anything else. And so take, for example, the academic context. Somebody discovers something new. They have an insight in a field, right? Maybe it's Einstein uh, who uh, f- finds the flaw in Newtonian physics and opens up this brand new line of inquiry, right? That brand new line of inquiry is going to pay dividends at a spectacular rate. And the problem is that what we infer from that is that this is the truth rather than this is the next S curve. And the school of thought that owns all of those gains in what we call the bargain phase ends up killing off all its competitors. So at the point that it hits diminishing returns, which is predictable enough, there's nobody left who remembers how to think any other way because the school of thought that was so dominant taught all of the students. And so if you realize this is the pickle you're in, then you realize that the obvious thing to do is never to whittle down to one school of thought. You at least need the second most vibrant school of thought to be uh, fed and protected through lean times because that's likely, I mean, this goes back to the conversation we were having at the beginning of this about what's on the fringe. You know, what's on the fringe is the school of thought uh, that's on the outs because something else is paying high dividends. But of course, that's a finite process until you've got the ultimate diminishing returns curve, until you've discovered, you know, enough of the truths that there isn't the next one. Which is a a long way out. Physics actually fell into this uh, in a famous way. Uh, uh, The uh, the search for the theory of everything in string theory uh, and the funding flew to string theorists, the PhD wannabe students came to the theorists, and instead of cranking out one PhD student a year, as is typical for a physicist, they were cranking out five. And by the early double aughts, this is an astounding number, 60% of the graduating PhDs in physics were string theory people. Well, it's turned out string theory, maybe there's something there for in the very long term, but at least in the term short term, it appears to be a bit of a dry hole. And so physics had to essentially re-diversify itself from relatively small islands that were outside of string theory. And now it's done so, but essentially it may have lost a whole generation of physicists who got over sucked into the vortex of string theory. Right. And now I uh, always point out that in part, the poor discipline of physicists with respect to the term theory is part of the problem here. Because, because there's no evidence for string theory. It's it's a purely a hypothesis. It's they, not even a hypothesis, right? Yeah, in order they, to be a hypothesis, it would have, have to, to point be, to the experiments. Yeah. It would have to be testable. And so my point is, this is actually string notion. Yeah, this, this is, doesn't make truth, it wrong. Truthfully, it's string math so far. And the, the, apparently the math is so beautiful. I'm not a serious mathematician. Yeah, I can do differential equations and shit like that. But, but theoretical math ain't my thing. But the people that look at the string theory say it is beautiful math. And that's really all it is so far. Uh, now, there are there, it is possible that there will be some experiments but nobody's even been able to conceptualize one that we could do in the next hundred years, right? Which is a little scary. So it's uh, to your point, discipline of supplying the scientific method 
It should definitely not be called a theory. Yeah. Uh, and, and calling it a hypothesis is uh, with a, a grace and a nod about the fact that they can speculate <laughs> about some experiments they might be able to do in 200 years. <laughs> Hopefully it becomes a hypothesis at some point. In the meantime, yeah. it's string cheese. That's my it, feeling. I like it. So, yeah, uh, Lee Smolin, who I've had on my show, uh, has written very eloquently about uh, the bad attractor in physics that grossly overstaffed uh, string mathematics uh, for a considerable period of time and probably uh, slowed uh, the human species uh, rate of innovation down uh, to a measurable degree. Because an awful lot of our uh, fundamental advances come from physics. If people had been working in solid states uh, physics around uh, the parasitism that occurs at the four nano level level in computer chips, we might be a whole uh, generation ahead in computer chips, for example. Yeah, uh, just it's an interesting thing. Well, yeah. Well, well, Opportunity uh, cost is a, is, a, is a bitch. Absolutely. Absolutely. So what else do we want to talk about here? I, I'm going to have to run in about 10 minutes, but. Uh, uh, well, I don't okay. know. I, I, we've, we've done a pretty good job here. I mean, I do think I guess there is one other thing that I, I want to talk about. All right, let's hop into it. Um, I think, you know, in, in watching people's reaction uh, to Elon's successful takeover of Twitter, I'm struck by the fact that it brings up an echo of another conversation. All right. I often say, I'm sure you won't disagree with this either, um, that the best form of governance is sure to be um, a, a brilliant benevolent dictator. And that the problem with the benevolent dictator plan uh, is two things. One, there's a question of whether they remain benevolent at the point that they accumulate power. I don't think it's as certain as many people would have you believe that every person becomes corrupt upon having great power. But I do think there's something about power that tends to accumulate corrupt people. But the second thing, and maybe even the more critical flaw of a benevolent dictator um, program is uh, there's no rational way, there's no handoff plan that keeps something in the hands of a benevolent dictator. But anyways, th there's a third one too, which is, uh, for any big problem, the benevolent dictator, if it was a benevolent dictator for the janitor at your school, it might be great. Uh, but a benevolent dictator for, uh, you know, a country, uh, he needs a whole bureaucracy and the bureaucracy inevitably becomes corrupt. Will and not especially be if it's only answering to one person and their careers are in his hand forever. OK, uh, I, I take that. I agree with you. Um, but in this case, I guess my feeling about the takeover of Twitter in principle, if you said to me, you know, 10 years ago, are you in favor of these giant tech platforms being in the hands of, um, you know, billionaires with effectively absolute control over how they function? Obviously, my instinct would be, hell no, that sounds pretty freaking dangerous. Um, on the other hand, at this point, am I willing to bet on a particular uh, a billionaire who appears to have a desire to solve extremely difficult problems and has a good head on his shoulder, a broad knowledge of uh, different disciplines. Um, yeah, in this case, I'm willing to bet on the kind of guy who could get electric cars to where he's gotten them, could get a private space program to where he's gotten it. Um, and it doesn't mean that it's guaranteed to work, but it does mean that it beats the hell out of any other alternative on the table, right? We are talking about a benevolent dictator, but a benevolent dictator that's closer to the janitorial department at the school than it is to, you know, civilization as a whole. And I'm, I'm with you there. It's funny you mentioned this is actually good because if, yeah, if you'd asked me 10 years ago, if suppose the richest guy in the world who made his money doing something entirely else came in and took over one of the main uh, uh, online platforms uh, to run it the way he wants with an extreme point of view, probably, I would have said almost certainly a horrible idea, right? Because I would yep. imagine somebody like Larry Ellison, right? Or Bill Gates or somebody like that. I go, ah! No, or it'd be please. like it'd be like uh, Jeff Bezos taking over the Washington, Washington Post, Post so right. that he could, you know, strangle democracy in the darkness or something. Exactly. But yeah. But yeah. So I think you're right that this is an idiosyncratic and therefore risky proposition. But nonetheless, it feels right. Uh, you know, uh, 
you know, get, maybe we're all wrong. Maybe the dude is just a the usual vile shit that corporate America throws up. But it doesn't seem like it. I mean, the guy seems authentic. He seems curmudgeonly. He seems like he doesn't give two fucks what anybody thinks. Uh, all the things that, in my experience, have made for people who can do serious innovation and uh, serious innovation, particularly in the because, you know, he's going to get unbelievable amount of flack from the people who had this chokehold around the discourse. Um, and this this is, I think, such a tell. You know, the people who instinctively think Elon move is bad. Uh, most of them are not thinking at the level we're talking about here. They're talking about the fact that their side no longer will have the chokehold on discourse. You know, they don't, they, they may not even realize yeah. that's what's motivating, but this is motivated thinking big fucking time. And uh, so it's a real tell that people are instinctively, ah, the world will end to be on my stage over Twitter, uh, you know, are, are basically are telling me that uh, they don't want their side to lose this, uh, this stick in the fight. Yeah. And, they, they, they do not like the idea that somebody is going to disarm them and create a level playing field field because they've been enjoying you know everything i can tell about uh elon could be i could be wrong right uh is that he really sincerely wants uh a good faith marketplace of ideas where the good ideas will build gradually build support and prosper and the bad ideas will gradually disappear and sink into the into the uh, ground now that's much harder to do than it is to say, but at least he wants to do it, uh, right. which, which is not something I see in any of the other players. Well, so here's the, the, there are a couple interesting pieces of the puzzle that sit, sit somewhere near here. Um, one, there's something about the startup process that allows people to become powerful without being trained into corruption. In other words, I think there's something vibrant about uh, startups in large measure because they do have this exponential growth potential, which can take quirky people who do have, you know, their own way of viewing things and put them in positions of, of significant power. And it tends to erode away. But um, Musk's rise has been so spectacular in terms of the wealth at his disposal that in some sense, I think he carries whatever values he's got. Obviously, they're not going to be completely unchanged by what he's been through. But in some sense, he's doing something that looks more like what I would expect somebody who became that wealthy to do than what most really wealthy people do, right? It, most, it, most really wealthy people, most of the billionaires, look to me like it has made them timid rather than bold. And I don't quite get it because I feel like it should be exactly the opposite way. The people with fuck you money should be bolder about their visions and bolder about doing something wild and less concerned about failure. And I see a lot of the opposite. And yeah, I, I that, think that is weird. That is strange. And it, but it is very true. Uh, you know, that, uh, you know, the whole point of fuck you money is being able to say, fuck you. Right. And, you know, truthfully, I made my fuck, fuck you money pretty young. And I have taken advantage of that platform to say, fuck you lots of times. Yes, you <laughs> but, have. <laughs> uh, but the uh, but the people that don't, I mean, why would you be, uh, you know, a, you know, a multi-billionaire and to become a, a timid toady? What the hell's that about? Right. Right. Uh, but we know Elon's not that. In fact, I, I believe, hey, Elon, if you're listening, I believe you're game B and don't know it yet. Uh, you know, having sold all your mansions and gotten rid of your fancy cars and live in a uh, $85,000 uh, shitbox house in West Texas. Uh, you know, the game B, the game B spirit is in the lab. <laughs> it's strong, right? And uh, I, I, you know, again, you can be wrong, uh, but I got a good sense about Elon here. That I his have the same in the right sense. Place. He's not one of these people that's fallen into timidity. Uh, and, and of course, a uh, big part of it is not giving a fuck what the other rich dudes think, right? Uh, you know, you saw the kind of <laughs> fairly bad taste uh, image of he made of, uh, of Gates the other day. That was pretty good. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, uh, uh, you know, that shows me he just doesn't care. 
And that's what you need right now. You need somebody who cares about humanity, uh, cares about the trajectory of the human race. Yeah, There's another sign that I tell that he's a good guy. He's obsessed with going to Mars. Yep. Uh, by the way, I think that's probably a bad idea. It'll turn, it'll turn out the asteroids are where we should go first uh, for a number of reasons. But he may be right and I may be wrong. But the fact that he has said things like, I want to be buried on Mars, right, uh, makes me realize that this is not Jeff Bezos, or this is not Larry Ellison, or this is not uh, whatever apparatchik is running General Motors these days, right? Uh, this is a, a guy who uh, you know marches to the beat of a different drum, and that's just what we need right now. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree, and I think there is something quite hopeful in it. I, I will say that there is also something very hopeful in uh, Mark Andreessen's uh, recent exploration of what he's calling uh, the current thing. Um, th this strikes me as a positive, you know, another person who's achieved great wealth doing something early in his life that made him uh, quite wealthy and powerful. Um, and that, you know, I also know him a bit. He, he's quite a deep thinker. And yeah, I know him too. I, I knew him before he got rich. Oh, is that right? I was a mentor to him. Uh, he was a little rich, but he wasn't, you know, big swinging dick of the valley. Uh, it was back when he was the CTO for AOL, believe it or not. Oh, my uh, goodness. We, we used to hang out and, uh, you know, I gave him one of his first public speaking opportunities and things of that sort. Uh, he is a, a Im impressive he was an impressive young man. So I looked at it at the time and he's grown up to be a very impressive dude in general. Yep. Absolutely. Uh, agree. And I'm very favorable to the way he is, um, you know, turning, turning his attention to the way our, uh, collective consciousness, uh, works or more often than not doesn't work. Uh, I think it's very productive. And I have to say, I also feel that there's something about what Peter Thiel is up to at the moment. You know, his speech at the Bitcoin conference also struck me as um, an important, bold move in which, you know, he basically planted a flag and he pointed to the uh, the gerontocracy and, um, you know, outlined what I thought was a pretty interesting model of the way we should think about Bitcoin versus Ethereum, etc. So anyway, I don't know, but I do have a sort of sense, you know, and uh, um uh, somehow pieces of Gen X that have gotten very wealthy and powerful through unusual mechanisms that have left them mentally intact are on the move. And, you know, I don't mean to say, you know, Peter Thiel and I disagree on a whole bunch about the way to view the world, but nonetheless, I am heartened to see that people are actually up for a major change and that I think in some sense, they are feeling the same urgency that uh, motivated uh, Game B and other such endeavors to start thinking big. Yep, well, there's something in the air right now. I and mean, frankly, all you gotta do is look around, see how fucked up shit is. And if uh, <laughs> uh, if you're not blind, uh, then you should be thinking about bold alternatives. And it is great, uh, though. Again, we should caution that have it being driven by peculiar oligarchs is a dangerous strategy and that the people themselves need to get some skin in the game here. And, oh, I, I, and I think in some sense, this is the message we've converged on here. This is a dangerous strategy, but it is so late in our trajectory. We are in such danger that at some level, as dangerous as it is to have uh, oligarchs effectively navigating based on their own understanding and the understanding of those around them. It's a better plan than allowing this system to continue on autopilot because it's going to get us killed. Here, here. All right. Thanks so much, Jim. This has been uh, really enlightening. Um, I will, of course, post a link to your piece. I would strongly encourage people to read it, to think about it, and to extrapolate from it, figure out what we haven't figured out and that could be added to the the model or critiques that need to be made anyway it's a it's a living discussion and i look forward to seeing where it goes ah, thank you brett it's been a wonderful conversation and i think we actually came up with some good new stuff here today i think so too all right be well jim and be well everyone else all right bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.